What is up, College Across fans? Memorial Day weekend is here, and you are watching one of the last kind of college lacrosse-based uh, Lax Factor lacrosse podcasts uh, for this season. We'll do one on uh, Tuesday morning, recapping the whole season, and then we'll do a couple of follow-ups, but we're getting close to the end here. By far, one of the most exciting weekends of the year. It's a, it's a holiday for normal people, and it's a great holiday ushering in the summer. For lacrosse fans, Memorial Day weekend is the mecca of all holidays. This is what we all wait for. I've, since I was a kid, I've waited for this weekend. And this year, we have great matchups. We have two rematches. We have Yale and Penn State. They've already met in late February, and Yale handed Penn State their only loss of the season at that point. Duke and Virginia met in mid-April, and Duke came out the victor in that. So we have matchups in both semifinals. Final rounds. The teams are very different now, but it'll be interesting to get to talk about these with a little bit of history this recently from this season. As always, if you want to try to support us, you can uh, just simply like, subscribe, hit the notification bell so you're notified when we put out more videos, and uh, share the video. Let other people know that, hey, there's a podcast out there you might listen to. If you really want to support us, we have swag. Go to laxfactor.com. You can get t-shirts, coffee mugs. You can get Paris to shorts. And if you were, were I said we were going to do the drawing for this jersey. We're not doing the drawing yet. We're going to do the drawing on Tuesday morning's show. We're going to announce who won. So we're giving everybody one more chance to win the tribelacrosse.com's America Fuck yeah, Penny here. So just make a thoughtful comment below on this video. Anything about the games, who do you think is going to win, blah, 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 and you'll get entered to win. We will announce on Tuesday morning's show who the winner is. I digress. Let's get into this. The Lax Factor Podcast. And the first matchup, number two, the number two seed Duke against the number three seed Virginia. Now, I, I got this pretty much right in terms of who I've picked. You know, I've still got Virginia in my bracket and I've still got Penn State in my bracket. I did not pick Duke. Uh, to make it here. I had Virginia, I believe, beating Hopkins in the final four, but either way, I'm still okay. Duke beat Virginia in in these guys' first matchup 12 to 7. They met on April 13th. Michael Kraus did not play in that game. I'm not sure why. He must have had some sort of injury. Matt Moore was four and one for UVA. Mikey Herring was two and one for UVA and crickets from everyone else. I think Ian Laviano might have had an, a, a goal. Aiken might have had an assist, and that was it. The UVA stars were very quiet. Now, this was a very different UVA team, though. This UVA team, this loss marked the beginning of them playing like savages through the rest of the year. So this was not the, the hustle ball UVA that, that wins every ground ball battle, that hustles harder than their opponent on every every scrap that they have. This was not that team. In this game, Duke out-hustled UVA. Duke got the hustle points, despite UVA winning some key key stats here. Duke, Joe Robinson, Robertson, 3-1. Duke Duke's key is when Robertson plays well, or at least when two or three of their stars play well, they win games. So Robertson, 3-1. and one, Carpenter, 2-2. Two and two, Brad Smith and Nakai Montgomery, 2-1. and one. one of Duke's problems has been if, uh, let's say, Brad Smith shows up, Robertson doesn't show up. If Robertson shows up, Brad Smith hasn't showed up. So what they need to do is get all of their stars to play consistently well, like Virginia's have as of late. In the goalie battle, Turner Upgren, 12 saves. Alex Rhodes, 16 saves. So both keepers, these keepers have both been shaky at times this year, but both of these keepers played good games in their matchup back on April 13th. Another key here, JT Giles Harris and Cade Van Raphorst for Duke. They In this game, they combined for 11 ground balls and two forced turnovers. Uh, uh, UVA, this is the big one. UVA won 15 to 22 faceoffs in that game and still managed to lose this game by quite the spread, by a, a five goal spread. And then also, Duke was three of six on man ups to UVA's 0 for 2. So Duke totally outplayed, out hustled UVA throughout the course of this game, despite UVA winning some key, key stats. Now, what does that mean for this time around? And it pretty much. We need to see the, you know similar things out of Duke, and we need to see better things out of UVA. One of the keys is going to be, can Duke out-hustle UVA again? As I said, after this game, Duke, it kind of was a wake-up call for Virginia, and we have not seen the same Virginia team play again since this. It, since this Duke loss, we've seen all of the Virginia stars pretty much show up in every game to a degree. You know, a point, two points at least, and then everybody factors. So can Duke... 
can Duke cage the UV, the animal that has been playing inside UVA here during this game? I'm not sure. The other question is what goalies are showing up? Both of these goalies are at either 50% or lower. I think Road is at a 49% save percentage and Upgren's at a 50% save percentage. But both of these goalies at times have played really tough lacrosse and have made key saves. So which goalies are we going to get? Are both goalies going to show up again like they did last time? Or is only one of them going to show up? Because that's a fear uh, for both of these teams. I say that you could almost guarantee more Kraus, Laviano, Aiken, and Conrad are going to show up. I say that even though the last time these two teams met, they didn't show up. And the reason why is because Duke has poles. They've got Cade Van Raphorst. They've got JT Giles Harris. They've got Welsh. Can those three guys contain whatever players they happen to be guarding on that possession? I don't think they're going to shut anybody down, and I don't think that any one of those Duke stars, uh, defensive stars, is going to be locked onto a single player that whole game. I think you'll you'll end up seeing them float just based on the way that Virginia plays offense. Sometimes they're going to be able to get the matchups they want. Sometimes Virginia is going to force their hand, and they're just going to have to guard who they're on at that time as the ball comes down in transition. So one of the keys is going to be, can those three Duke defenders hold their owns in the ma- hold their own in the matchups against some of these Virginia stars like Aiken, uh, Laviano, Conrad, Kraus, uh, you name it. Mostly it's going to be Moore and Kraus that are going to draw probably Van Raphorst and Giles Harris. So it'll be interesting to see how those matchups go. I don't think that UVA is going to keep them all boxed in, but can they contain them a little bit? Can they can they keep some of those points off the board? And I think the big possessions going or the big key is going to be, can they keep some of the uh, six on six battles? Can they can they shave some of the six on six goals that UVA may score off because the transition goals are going to come anyway? And then what are, what are Duke stars going to do? Is Robertson going to show up? Is 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 Smith going to show up? Is Montgomery going to show up? Montgomery's been their playoff wonder the last two years, and it's already continued into the first two games of this tournament. So can Duke get all of their guys on the same page in the same game? Because if they can, they're as good as anybody. But if one of those stars doesn't show, if Smith has a rough game, if Robertson has a rough game, or if they are able to contain Montgomery or force him into some turnovers – then it might it's good you know then things are going to sway back towards Virginia again. So, and then one of the other keys here is I talk about if Van Raphorst and Giles Harrison Welsh can shut some of the the Virginia stars down for Virginia to counter that because I think that some of their looks are going to be uh, tempered and I think some of the you know that they will get some stops on the Duke side a little bit. What are guys like Herring going to do and some of the guys further down the roster? You, for UVA, if if, if Kraus is only going to go two and two in this game, is Herring going to go two and zero oh in this game, or something like that? So that's going to be key for Virginia. I think in this game, first team to fourteen goals wins it. I don't think it's going to be the seventeen goal shootout, although it could be. I think that that, that things will be a little bit more slowed down by Duke's defense, and Virginia is going to have to play and fight a little bit on that side of it. So I think the first team to fourteen goals wins. My prediction in this game, and I'm sticking with what I went with in the beginning, it's UVA. Uh, the question is by what? Why not a one goal game? I see UVA winning this game by one goal. I see one of the teams maybe even getting a lead again, three, four goals, and then one of them having to battle back. I, I figure it's just going to be a cliche at this point. The the one goal game, the games of runs, but one team battles back to make it interesting. It, it, it's just what keeps happening, and I don't see that being any different here. My bold take. Conrad and Dox Aitken are going to combine for seven goals in this game. Now they haven't, they don't do that a lot. I think that the the thing here and what's going to force them to have to do that here is going to be that the the Duke poles are going to take some of the production away from the Virginia attackmen, and that's going to open things up for either Conrad and Dox Aitken, depending on the possession, the slide package, and all of that good stuff. So excellent game. That is our first game on Saturday at noon. We move on to number one. Penn State against number five, Yale. This is the 230 game, or you know, the, the game after the first game on Saturday. Once again, another matchup, another rematch. Yale beat Penn State 14-13 in their first meeting on February 23rd. It is the only loss to date that Penn State has endured. As part of that, TD Erlen murked. Penn State winning 25 of 31 of his face-off draws. He picked up 22 ground balls on the day. You're going to have that. And one goal. Erlen won 19 of 23 of the draws over Gerard Arceri. So that was key in this game, that, that Yale had all those possessions and Penn State so potent offensively that it didn't matter. They were still able to, to keep this a one-goal game. So... 
key here is going to be, I don't know that, that Erlen can re repeat what he did against Arseri. Arseri is a very capable face-off man. And I remember when I watched this game earlier in the year, I was surprised that, that Erlen had, had beat them all so badly in this, in this arena. So interesting to see, but that, that's what happened the first time around. In the first time around for Penn State, Ament was two and seven. O'Keefe had five goals. For Yale, Morrill was two and five. Gata and Rooney, three goals each. Matt Brandau, one goal and two assists. He's continued his great run. Goalie battles, neither goalie played great. Canise, 10 saves. Star, seven saves. Neither were awesome. Uh, the keys in this game was that Yale got a lot more quality or, or Yale got more quality shots overall, but they turned the ball over a ton. TD won faceoffs and won possessions. He had no turnovers, and that was one of the keys, I think, in Yale winning this game was TD at times will will wreck people on the faceoffs, but he will turn the ball over one or two or three times as part of that faceoff win, which really turns it into a loss. He didn't do that at all. He won every faceoff and contained possession. Another key was Yale that hurt Yale, despite all those face-offs wins, was that they they hurt their face-off wins and offset that with penalties. Penn State was four of five man up uh, to Yale's one of three, and then Yale didn't clear the ball well. Yale failed on a f uh, four of 17 clears on the day, which they'll have to do a little bit better here. So even though Yale won those face-offs between the penalties, between turning the ball over on clears, and uh, just turning the ball over in general, uh, Yale kind of tends to even things out, and it it, it lessens the effect that TD Erlen plays into the game a little bit. Uh, the keys this time around, obviously, TD needs to dominate again at the faceoff X. He has to do it. To, to be able to limit Penn State's possessions, that he has to win those faceoffs. He has to retain possession on them because you cannot give Penn State the ball too often. And as part of that too, Penn State, they need to try to force 50-50 balls at the faceoff X. They're not going to beat TD on the drop. They're not going to beat him on the draw. They need to win. They need to force a 50-50 scrum and then win those. And even that's tough to win against um, Yale because Yale's excellent on the wings as well. Penn State, no, actually also Yale needs to stay out of the penalty box. You know, you can't give up five penalties or six penalties even to Penn State because they're going to score three goals. You give up five penalties to Penn State, you're going to be hard-pressed to hold them to less than three goals off those five penalties. So they need to try to limit their penalties. Penn State needs to capitalize off all of the transition and extra man opportunities that they can. Assuming Yale does murk them at the face-off dot, then Penn State's going to have to just take care of the ball in transition and score the goal. And then they're going to have to score goals in extra man opportunities as well which they typically do. So I'm not saying this is like, this is some grand thing that has to go well for them. They typically do that. And then Yale needs to just take care of the ball overall. They're going to need to clear the ball more effectively, more specifically, because Penn State's been excellent at riding through this playoff run. But Yale just in general is going to have to take care of the ball and more importantly, take care of the ball and clears. Don't let your defense get a stop against Penn State and then give the ball right back to them because more often than not, that result results in a goal as well. My prediction... In this game, and I think this is going to come down to one goal as well. I guess it's easy to make a one-goal prediction because I'm not pissing anyone else off as much also. But my prediction, Penn State by one goal. And my bold take, and it's not much of a bold take these days, is that Mac O'Keefe is going to score seven goals. His evolution as an off-ball attackman is just next level. These guys playing with each other the way that didn't sound good. That's what she said. I guess that's not what she said. But the way that these guys have gelled over the course of the season – and the way that they play this sport, this game with each other has been incredible. Mac O'Keefe off ball is just incredible. The way he sees the field, the way he positions him, himself on the field so that other guys can easily see him and then and then feed him. It's it's incredible. So Penn State by a goal. Mac O'Keefe scores seven goals or more. That is my hot take. But I'm not even going to go into it anymore. I let, Let's just enjoy this weekend of games, you can hit me up on Facebook, hit me up on Twitter. Uh, there's a college lacrosse discussion group on Facebook that you can join called the College Lacrosse Discussion Group. If you love college lacrosse, search that out and uh, and join that, or maybe hit me up and ask me for an invite, and I can throw you into the group. Great group if you love college lacrosse. As always, you want to get some swag? Go to laxfactor.com. Be sure to like and subscribe. And if you want to get this jersey from tribelacrosse.com, you can win this. We're going to announce the winner on Tuesday. All you got to do is comment on this video. Just don't make it stupid. Just say anything. Make sure the comment has something to do with the games this weekend, and you're good to go, and you'll get an entry. And that is it. Enjoy the games this weekend. Thank you for watching. <laughs>